Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the scriptures teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. All right, good to have everybody back in here with us again. And for those of you joining us on television, we certainly love to uh, have the opportunity to come into your what, living room, den, or whatever. And uh, we're just an informal Bible study, and all I hope to do is to get folks to search the Scriptures, to read and study their Bible, and see what it really says. You know, I'm always pointing out, it isn't so much what it says as what it does not say. Because here's where the deception comes in. When the counterfeiters can come along and they will make it sound like the Bible says something, and whenever people call with a question with something like that, the first thing I ask them, can you find it in your Bible? No, that's why I'm calling. Well, if you can't find it in your Bible, you better just cross it off and run from it because that's all part and parcel of the mass deception that Jesus warned us about. So all we do is we encourage folks to search the Scriptures, whether I say it or whether someone else says it. Line them up with the book. Okay. I think I can at this time remind folks that all of the past programs are available on uh, videotape and the audio tapes and the printed page and we've put them in a format of 12 programs on each one of these which means you get a six hour video or a six hour audio or a 12 lesson little booklet. So if you're interested in any of those things you just give us a call or drop us a note on and uh, we'll get the information out to you. All right. We got a lot of ground to cover again, so we'll go right back to where we picked up or where we left off. We'll pick up now in 2 Thessalonians in the same <coughs> verse that we just left, verse 9, but we'll be shortly going into verse 10. <coughs> 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 9, once again. Even him, the wicked one, of verse 8, whom the Lord will, of course, destroy at the end of the tribulation, he's going to meet his doom. He's a man born of a woman, and he's going to go to his eternal doom, the same as other lost people. But, of course, this individual and the false prophet will be unique in that they do not have the benefit of the great white throne. Now, if you know your Bible, you know that all the lost people of the ages will have their moment with God before the great white throne. But these two men don't. They'll go straight from their earthly uh, existence to the eternal lake of fire, according to the book of Revelation. All right, but now then, this man, Antichrist, comes with all the power and the working of Satan, and he's going to perform signs and miracles and lying wonders. And as we picked up in our last program, the book of Revelation agrees with that 100%. And the world will be deceived by it. They're going to fall for it. Hook, line, and sinker. That after all, this guy is performing things that only God can do, so it must be God. But I hope that we're making the point that Satan is such a master counterfeiter that he can do almost the same things that God can do. Now, never forget, God is sovereign. God is still in control. Satan can never go any further than God permits him to go, but God's going to let him come awful close to the originals. You know, I would like to use the analogy of uh, counterfeiters of currency. The guy that can get by counterfeiting American currency is the guy that can come the closest to our original bills. And if he can come so close that the average American can't detect it, they can go quite a while before the experts will finally catch it. Well, it's the same way with spiritual things. These counterfeiters can confuse the masses, and the less they know of Scripture, the easier they are to confuse and the longer they can hold them. And so that's why we teach, my goodness, know what the truth is, so that when you hear something that is not truth, it'll bring up red flags. All right? So he's going to bring in tremendous signs and lying wonders, and now going on into verse 10, and with all deceivableness, or a better word I guess we could say, with all deceit, with all deceit of 
unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth. All right, now what does the word perish imply here? Well, you all know John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that whosoever believeth in him should not, what? Perish. Now you all know what that word is talking about. It's eternal doom, eternal separation from God. That's what the word perish here means. Now Paul's using it in the same way. These people are going to go to their eternal doom having followed the signs and wonders and miracles of the counterfeit Christ, but the sad part is many of them are going to be people who heard the gospel in its full truth and rejected it. Now, we're going to take this real slow because this is a question that's coming up more and more, especially after one of these famous series of books. Is there an opportunity for salvation for someone who has heard the gospel, missed the rapture, and finds themselves in the tribulation? No. No. There will be no second chance if, now this is the big if, if they have heard heard the true gospel, have contemplated it, have been convicted of their need of it, and then turn around and say, thanks but no thanks, or as, who was it, King Agrippa, who said, at some more convenient time, how many people today aren't doing just that? Well, yeah, I know I should get saved, but I want to live the good life for a while. I'll do that later. Well, you see, this is exactly what this verse is saying. They're going to come under a deceitful regime. They're going to come under the deceitful power of Satan. And they're actually going to enjoy unrighteousness. Oh, the wickedness of that period is going to be beyond our comprehension. Well, I just happened to flip to it. Now that's something, isn't it? Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 9. Now this is the book of Revelation, and this just fits hand in glove with what Paul is teaching in Thessalonians. Revelation chapter 9, and drop down to verse 20. Now remember, there's going to be tremendous loss of life during these final three and a half years, because after all, the whole world's population is going to have to go down the tube with the exception of a small percentage. Six and a half billion people are going to be losing their life in these seven years, most of them in the last half. All right, but now look what it says in verse 20. There are still some people that haven't lost their life as we come toward the end. And so the rest of the men who were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of their works of their hands that they should not worship demons and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. Neither did they repent of their, now watch it, this is going to be the common occurrence of every society around the planet in those closing months or couple years of the tribulation. They will not repent of their murder nor of their sorceries. Now what sorceries? Drawing on satanic power, see? They're not going to repent on that. It could also mean drug culture, because the word sorcery in the Greek is pharmakia, from which we get pharmacy. So it'll be a drug culture. And of course, the verse almost describes it. So they won't repent of their murder, their drug culture, or their, their drawing on satanic power nor of their fornication, see, the gross immorality is going to run rampant, nor of their thefts, there's going to be no moral integrity, there's not going to be any honesty left, see, and they're going to revel in their wickedness. All right, come back again to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, so verse 10, so with all the deceivableness of unrighteousness, they're going to glory in their wickedness. 
But look who is going to be primarily guilty. It's going to be in them that perish are going to miss eternal life. And why are these people going to miss eternal life? Because they received not the love of the what? Truth. Now the world even likes to make a lot of truth. A lot of our universities will have over their main building the truth shall make you free. Well, they're not making reference to biblical truth. They're teaching from the philosophical point of view. But nevertheless, what is the truth that these people will have rejected previously? All right, let's take a few more. Come back a few pages first to, oh, you might as well stop at Ephesians. Come back through the Philippian letter. Come back to Ephesians chapter 1, and we're going to chase down now what the truth of the gospel really means. And remember, these people that Paul is writing about and that Revelation also describes are people who have rejected the truth. They've said, thanks, but no thanks. I don't want it. And they're going to find themselves in the tribulation. Even though mom and dad have prayed for them and have pleaded with them, they're going to have rejected all that, and they're going to find themselves in the horrors of the tribulation. And they're not going to suddenly come to their senses and say, well, this is what mom and dad were talking about. No, they're not. I've had husbands with unsaved wives have absolutely no concern. And these men will ask me, now, Les, when we go up in the rapture, will my wife suddenly wake up and realize that she's missed what I've been trying to tell her? I said, no. You know what's going to happen? When the news flashes that this man has now gone to Jerusalem and has signed a seven-year treaty with the Middle East, your wife is going to be the first to say, there's the one that I'm looking for. That's going to be their response. Now, you may think I'm stretching it, but let's look. All right, uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. Sorry, honey. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. In fact, look at the word Christ up in verse 12. Who first trusted in Christ, in whom? That is, in Christ, you also trusted, placed your faith after. Now watch this. This is meticulous. In whom you placed your faith. When? After you heard the word of what? Truth. truth. And what's the truth? The gospel. See how plain that is? No, you don't have to be a theologian to understand this. You placed your faith in Christ after you heard the gospel, the word of truth. See? And then, after you heard the word of truth and you believed it for your salvation, then that one in whom also after you believed, then you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Not a month later, not a year later, immediately. Now that's the whole modus operandi of God's plan of salvation. That we hear the gospel, we believe it, we are into the body of Christ, and at the same time the Holy Spirit puts His mark of identification on us that we're His. Instantaneously. You don't have to go through a trial to see if you're worthy of it. It's an immediate response to our faith. All right, but the point I want to make here, what is the word of truth? The gospel. All right, we're going to come to the gospel in a minute, but just turn back a page or two. I'm doing this to take it easy on your Bible. Come back a page or two to Galatians, and then we're going to go on back to 1 Corinthians. But now come back to Galatians chapter 2. Now in Galatians chapter 2, remember, Paul has been out there being confronted by these false Judaizers 
who were literally submarining his teaching with the teaching that these people could not be saved unless they were circumcised according to the law of Moses and kept the commandments. Legalism. And so Paul had to write this little book of Galatians to confront legalism in whatever shape or form it might be. Now, he began that line of teaching, of course, in about 40 A.D. Now here we are 12 years later, and the 12 apostles in Jerusalem are still, I think, grossly unhappy with what Paul is doing because they cannot reconcile these Gentiles claiming salvation just on Paul's gospel. Faith in the death, burial, and resurrection plus nothing. And so they too have been fomenting this pressure to the Gentile believers to be circumcised, to keep the commandments, in other words, to embrace Judaism to a degree. And so they bring Paul up to Jerusalem to confront the Twelve with what he's preaching. And now look what he says. Verse 4, And that because of false brethren unawares, or secretly, I'm in Galatians 2, verse 4, And because of these false brethren unawares, or secretly brought in, who came in privily, or again secretly, to spy out our, what? Liberty or our lack of legalism, and they came to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into what? Bondage. Now if you've ever talked to someone who has come out of a legalistic religion and they step into the glorious gospel of grace, what's the first thing they realize? You've come out of bondage. Now those of you who have never been in it, you don't understand what it is. You talk to some of these people. When they're scared to death that if they break one of the commandments, they're doomed. They're scared to death if they don't keep the Saturday Sabbath, they're doomed. That's legalism. Or you can put any other twist on it that you want. But when legalism holds the heavy thumb upon an individual, it's bondage. And grace is freedom. All right. Paul now has to go to Jerusalem to defend his gospel of grace and not put those Gentile believers back under a bondage. Got it? All right, now look what he says. Verse 5, To these people in Jerusalem, and I think it was the twelve as well as some of the other leaders, were trying to pressure Paul to put his Gentile converts back under the law or back under bondage, Look what he says in verse 5. To whom we gave place, or we gave in by subjection. What does that word imply? They were pressuring him. They were pressuring the man. Look, Paul, we can never put our stamp of approval on what you're doing until you agree to put your converts under the law. And the poor man is almost alone. Now, I know Barnabas was with him, if I remember right. But nevertheless, for the most part, it was the Apostle Paul against maybe at least 12 and maybe 15, 16, who knows how many others. Now listen, that's no fun place to be. I don't want to be up against 15 people trying to drive me down. One on one, hey, I'm comfortable. But one against 15 or 20, hey, that's enough to get anybody down. And this is what he's talking about, that when he came up to Jerusalem after these 12 years of ministering to the Gentiles, and they were pressuring him to put them back under the law or under bondage, he said, I did not give in to them. I stood my ground. But now read on. To whom we gave place by subjection, or in spite of subjection, no, not for an hour, and we usually use the term minute. I didn't give in for a minute. Now watch it. Paul says, I didn't give in so that, though what's the next word? Truth. truth. So that the truth of 
the gospel. You see that? Paul says, I did not give in to legalism. I did not give in to the pressure from the twelve that the truth of the gospel, and he qualifies the gospel he's talking about up there in verse 2, that gospel which I preach amongst the Gentiles. So he's not talking about the same gospel that Peter and John preached to Israel. He's talking about his gospel, the gospel of grace. And he says, I did not give in for a minute so that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Now think about that for a moment. Think hard. What if the Apostle Paul would have given in? Think about that. What if the man would have given in to that subjection? Yeah, our gospel of grace would have gone down the tube. Now, of course, God is sovereign, and we know he wouldn't have permitted it. But nevertheless, Christianity as we know it was on the line right here in Jerusalem in 51 or 52 A.D. And had it not been for the strength of the character of this Saul of Tarsus, now the Apostle Paul, you and I wouldn't sit here reveling in the grace of God. But he didn't give in. He stood his ground so that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. All right, what gospel is Paul talking about that he calls back to 1 Corinthians 15? What gospel does he call my gospel? What gospel does he call that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles? What gospel does he call the gospel of the grace of God? What gospel does he call the gospel of Christ? Here it is. And it's not John 3.16. John 3.16 doesn't have this gospel in it. Oh, some parts of it is certainly apropos. We know that unless we're saved, we're going to perish. But there's no death, burial, and resurrection in John 3.16. It hadn't even happened yet. And the disciples had no idea he was going to be going to a cross and die. But here, here we have the gospel. And I think Iris and I are being encouraged. We're seeing this gospel in print more and more, in articles, in books, like I've never seen it before. In fact, I was so amazed the other day, one of the major Christian magazines, in which I have never read it before. But bless their hearts, they delineated the two Gospels in the New Testament, the Gospel of the Kingdom to the Jew and the Gospel of the Grace of God through the Apostle Paul to us. I just couldn't believe it. In fact, the listener in Florida wrote and told us, did you see the article? Well, yeah, I'd already read it. But you see, it's encouraging, not because of me, but I think because the Spirit is beginning to open eyes other than mine to some of these truths that have been just laying there dormant I know I didn't grow up with it, but here it is. This is the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning at verse 1. 1 Corinthians 15, starting at verse 1. Moreover, brethren, so Paul is writing to believers at Corinth, I declare unto you, what's the article? The, not a, the. What does that signify? Singular. Singular. You know, I've put it on the program before. Our gospel is exclusivist. Of course it is. Our gospel isn't just one of many. There's only one. And people don't like to admit that. But the Word of God says there's only one. And here it is. And it's that gospel by which you are saved. See how plain this is? This is the gospel that saves lost people. Now you're saved if you keep in memory, and I always put it this way, if you understand what you believe, unless you have believed in vain, because you can't just take a head knowledge and agree to something. You have to have it in the heart, believe it with all your heart, that this is what you're placing your faith in. And here it is, verse 3 and 4. This is the gospel of the grace of God. 
This is what Paul calls my gospel. This is the gospel again that is referred to as that gospel which I preach to the Gentiles. Verse 3, For I delivered unto you first of all. They didn't hear it first from Peter. They didn't hear it first from Christ or anybody else. They heard it only from this apostle to whom this gospel was given. I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received. How that? Here it is now. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. It wasn't an afterthought. It was planned from before anything was ever created that Christ would pay the sin debt of lost humanity. Then verse 4. It wasn't a fake death. It wasn't just an unconscious state. He was dead to the point that he was buried and that he arose again the third day according to the Scriptures. The Old Testament was full of it, but in such veiled language, nobody could understand it. Nobody had an idea that this is how God was going to bring salvation to the whole human race until it was revealed to the Apostle Paul. And now Paul is commissioned to take this gospel first and foremost to the Gentile, but a Jew can certainly be saved by it. We're all on common ground today. And so this is the gospel that he refers to constantly as the truth of God. The gospel, how that Christ died for our sins and rose from the dead. Now, you all know the verse. We won't have to look it up in John's Gospel. That grace and truth came, how? By Jesus Christ. But the truth of this Gospel was not revealed until God poured it out on the Apostle Paul and sent him out into the Gentile world. And so this is what we have to understand, that people who have heard this Gospel that Christ died for them and rose from the dead, and they've rejected it, and they suddenly find themselves under the regime of the Antichrist, they're not going to be able to say, well, Mom and Dad were right. I remember that preacher was right. I'm going to go and get saved. No, beloved, it is not going to happen. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552 or call 1-800-369-7856. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.